Uh. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us on this little bit of a, uh, a an exploration of the S104 and designing a pumping station and what have you. Um, it's ever so strange sitting here in the house doing this. Uh, I'm sure I've met quite a few of you over the years when we do our uh, uh, lunch and learns. And we stand up in front of you and I can see your faces and see your reactions and get questions and what have you. So it's all a bit, uh, a bit, a bit strange in this strange time we live in. So designing a pumping station that is regulatory com compliant. Um, today, there's two of us, myself, Steve Angel Jones, and I'm an area sales manager looking after the Anglian and the Southeast part of the world uh, for sewage for adoption and package pump station. And my colleague, uh, we work as a team, so I'll call him my buddy. He's my design buddy, and it's Andy. So good morning, Andy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Good, all right. So we're gonna be looking at um, designing a pump station. Um, it, it's, it's, a big, it's a big step for any developer. Obviously, if they can run with gravity, they'd be more than happy to. But when it means you have to start pumping, then obviously you need to get your S104 in place. And this is where we come along. We work with the design house, we work with the developer and we work with the civils company and we make sure that the pump station is designed and is suitable to be adopted because that's the big thing, the adoption at the end of the period. So um, <clears throat> before I move forward, um, I just want to say, I hope you're all keeping safe. I hope this awful uh, COVID thing hasn't affected you too much. Um, we in Xylem, uh, we haven't closed. We've run through the whole period of time. Um, uh, what we have done obviously is, is move a vast majority of the staff into home offices. Um, and also our engineers throughout the whole period have been working. Uh, the only difference for our engineers now are that they can't travel to in a van. So each engineer has his own van. So if you call, at, call us out or we come to site, you'll see two vans at all times. Uh, the company's in, uh, invested quite a bit of money and time and effort to make sure we follow all the safety procedures. Uh, as area sales managers, there's four of us in the UK. Um, we have to follow strict company guidelines and, and we always obviously follow the guidelines on sites or your offices, uh, but the Zalim is a very, very, uh, um, it, it, it's a very strong company when it comes to looking after staff. So we have to follow very, very strict guidelines. You will still see us on the road. Um, I don't know what's happening over the next month or so, um, but um, I hope we can still get out and uh, do some site visits. Uh, and then just to end, as I said, safety of our staff and customers always comes first. Um, if you're not sure about us coming, then we'll do Zoom, we'll do team meetings, we'll do whatever you want but we're always here for you. Okay, agenda, <clears throat> sewers for adoption, SFA and SSG. What we need from you, what we do with the information you supply, section 104 approval process, the benefits and the pitfalls. And there are pitfalls, believe me, there are pitfalls. Zalem, your trusted partner, our portfolio, questions and answers. On the questions and answers, you'll see that you can you can ask questions on the on the chat Q and A function. Um, if we get time during the presentation, we'll answer them. But more than likely, we'll pick them all up at the end if you don't mind. Okay. So next slide. What is sewers for adoption? Sewers for adoption seven. We're eight now, but it's now called SSG. It's the guide of recommendations for the design and construction of a new pumping station, whether it be uh, um, foul or surface water. And we obviously have to work under all the uh, Water Industry Act 1990, 1991. And then there's supplement guidance addendums, um, which each of the water authorities add. Uh, Anglian Water asks us you know, different things compared to um, Severn Trent, compared to Yorkshire Water but we make sure that we've got all that information on our system. So when it comes to, <coughs> excuse me, when it comes to SFA8, 
and SSG is that, as they call it now, sewage sector guidance. Not only do we have that whole package built into our system, we also have all the addendums and all the little foibles that the water authorities require. SFA 6, 7 or SSG. This is the breakdown of the, uh, around the water authorities around the country. Um, we've only had notification from two of the water authorities, Anglium Water being one of them, uh, confirming that they uh, are going to run with SSG. And they did that in June this year. Uh, Thames Water say they will do it, um, but they haven't given us the data as yet. But I fully expect, or we fully expect, that most of the water authorities are going to link themselves to SSG as we move forward. Um, I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Andy now, if you don't mind. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> good morning again, everybody. Um, the, the good thing from the point of view of uh, foul water pumping stations is that uh, the, the move to SSG hasn't significantly changed much of the criteria that is already in place for SFA7. So in general, the, the foul sewage pumping stations and pump systems are only to be um, <coughs> applied to a site where it's confirmed that the whole life cost is less than a conventional gravity system, gravity system will be. And and that's taken over a period of 40 years. An area that has been notably uh, changed uh, by SSG is the, uh, the, the incidence of surface water pumping stations. Now, the, uh, the requirements here um, have put a significant uh, amount of attention towards the application of SUDS. Uh, and the aim of SUDS is to uh, mimic natural uh, drainage processes uh, via a range of approved processes to uh, to deal with surface water. So, although there will be uh, uh, still requirements for surface water pump stations, which we're able to address, uh, we expect the uh, the incidence of uh, surface water pump station inquiries to uh, to drop um, in line with this uh, new strategy. Um, if we look at the next uh, uh, slide, I'll, uh, I'll go through uh, the, uh, the control panel uh, and distances from dwellings just to cover that um, in a little bit more uh, detail for you. So the, uh, the typical layouts that we saw in SFA 7 uh, are still applicable uh, for the type 1 and 2 and the type 3 stations. And indeed for type 4s, which are a, a, a more uh, consultative uh, type 3 um, station, with the, uh, which is taken with the water authority. So um, in terms of location, uh, one of the big changes uh, that's uh, required through SSG is an assessment of the trafficked roads to and from the sites. So for a type one and type two, you'd uh, expect a busy road or there's uh, a large volume of traffic and the risk assessment dictates that uh, the operators need uh, a safe area of, uh, for park in the vans. For the type threes, uh, we still need the, uh, the, the tanker hard standings. Um, there's a requirement uh, from some of the uh, water companies currently to have turning heads within the, uh, the, the station, uh, if at all possible. Um, if not, then that can be outside of the area. But uh, the other element that's been brought to, uh, to things by SSG is that the water companies need to be able to see the, water, uh, the, the pump stations easily from the approach roads. So they can't be hidden away behind uh, large uh, screen planting and things like that. They've got to be readily visible uh, uh, for, for people that are visiting the site for the first time. So that's those are minor changes, uh, but they, they can have a, a bit of an impact at the early stage for uh, drainage consultant layout uh, and architects layouts, if they're not familiar with that. Um, the, uh, the, the control panels uh, for the sites, they have to be mounted in a position where they're, uh, they're readily accessible, but secure. They have to be raised above the one in 30 or if advised the one in 100 year flood uh, plane. Uh, so that can have an impact on the level of the, uh, the, the plinth, et cetera. And also the uh, ratings of the electrics, uh, electronics inside the uh, kiosk and the positioning of them. 
for type three stations, particularly uh, there's got to be adequate space for the uh, locating a, a, a temporary generator and that's got to be outside the uh, hard standing bit, which is used for other, uh, other opportunities. Um, distance from the, uh, the wet well to the nearest property, the cordon center, that stays the same for a type one, five meters, type two, that's 10 meters and type three and beyond uh, 15 meters. Uh, we'll have a look at the next slide, if we can, please, Steve. So another area that's not really changed, but what one of the areas we wanted to cover this morning, because it, it, it can cause a lot of confusion early on, is emergency storage. So the, both states that to avoid fl sewage flooding at or upstream of the pumping station during a plant or power failure, the additional storage should be provided and this storage should be located above the high level alarm in the pump station, but below the lowest private connecting lateral drains invert. So, so we don't um, flood uh, private drainage systems. The plan area of the wet well below the level of the high level alarm float switch can't be increased to form any part of this requirement. Um, so your storage effectively uh, is created in your upstream public sewers and your lateral drains and their associated manholes. Or if that proves to be uh, ins insufficient for your requirements, then there's a need to have uh, specifically uh, designed adjacent storage structures. Now to incorporate these storage structures, if you're, uh, and this is the, the problem area, if, you're, uh, if your levels for your upstream network are such that we can't get all the storage in there, then we have to artificially change the ullage in the wet well so that we can fit the hydraulics for your storage structure adjacent to the, to the system. And this normally means that we depress the depth of the wet well uh, in order to fit in that storage. So at the early stages, if you're able to provide us with um, a sort of P4, P, P2 level of uh, area drainage with invert levels for manholes, etc., we're usually able to come back to you at that very early stage of the, uh, the outline design and indicate um, what the, the true depth of the station is going to be. Um, it's always more problematic if we have to go back at detailed design stage several months in and tell you that the station needs to be two metres deeper because that can change the uh, the pump selections previously uh, advised and also the rising main. It has a number of impacts, which we'll go into later. Um, so for the foul water pumping stations, as we determined before, SFA7, Storage normally equates to 160 litres per dwelling and for commercial developments, about one hour of peak design flow. Obviously, there are a few addenda out there that uh, vary that slightly, but we're aware of those. The big change is, as we said before, emergency storage for surface water stations where SUDS is the preferred option. So there's less likely to be a number of pump, uh, surface water pumping stations out there, but where they are, then if there's no other criteria, we take the 125 cubic meters of storage uh, per hectare as the starting point for our designs. Can we go to the next slide, please, Steve? Yeah, <coughs> thanks, Andy. Um, well, after all that Andy's uh, explained there, um, how it works on our side uh, to get the uh, pump station designed and then obviously for the final adoption is that the scoping, and that tends to be um, the design house tends to be knocking on our door at, at, at the onset, sometimes the developer, but most of the design houses. And they place the inquiry. We obviously ask for as much information as possible, all the drawings, all the levels, all the items that uh, uh, Andy just mentioned. And then we build that into a solution and the solution basically develops into a quote. We send the formal quote to whoever's requested it. And that quote will, it's, it's 20, 20 odd pages long. And it, 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 it lays out ex exactly what we do, what we supply, when we supply it, all the items and obviously a price. Then once that's accepted by whoever's requested, it goes into the formal design. And this is where Andy and the other design engineers in Xylem, uh, they start to build the technical submission. 
and that, as I'm sure some of you have seen, it's 80, 90 pages thick. It's a, it's a big document, and rightly so, because this is the document that the Water Authority are going to issue their S-104 against. So the design gets submitted to the Water Authorities, and then you get approval. Ha! Sometimes we get approval on, on design A. Uh, most times it bounces back once, maybe twice, and it tends to be because the, the Water Authority is seeing something they're not quite happy with in the whole of the design of the development. So they might want the uh, uh, station moved or they might want clarification about levels or invert levels. So then we go backwards and forwards. But then the S104 is um, issued and we at Xylem, we start delivering the equipment and we start the installation on site. Once that's all in, installed, we go to commissioning and then the commissioning, as you can see, drops down to initial operation period. Sometimes though, um, after commissioning, there's a little bit of a problem. There's no, maybe no power supply or the developer wants to start running some show homes and some uh, get some people moved in quickly. So we can offer temporary dosing uh, to stop septicity or temporary pumping systems uh, with temporary panels and also gen sets uh, from our rental team. But then dropping down to initial operation period, the station's up and running, everyone's happy, and it runs for 18 months, maybe two years. And then the developer wants it handing over to the water authorities. So we get invited with the water authorities, the symbols and the developer, and we do a, a site visit and we go through snagging and fault resolutions. Sometimes there are issues that need to be changed. More, more than likely it's because over the last two years, the water authorities have changed their minds on certain things. So we have to change certain items. Um, uh, it's, most times it tends to be in the panel where they want other items installed. And then once that's done and dusted, everyone's happy, then the final adoption. And then the developer can get their bond back and everybody's happy. Important points to consider. As Andy mentioned, uh, the different compound layouts with perimeter fencing and security gate, the, the tanker hard standing for all off-road parking, the wet well and separate valve chamber. Wet wells uh, tend to be concrete rings and the valve chamber tends to be square brick. The control panel and kiosk, what are the most expensive parts of the whole operation? And something that we at Xylem, uh, if you order, a, a, the equipment, we would rather sit with the panel in our uh, um, offices or our stores until you're ready for it to be de delivered to site. It's, it's anywhere between 16 and 20,000 pounds. So you don't want that being at risk. Uh, the BT line and all radio mast and tenure telemetry. Um, it depends on the water authority. Anglian Water, they like a radio mast uh, and they like to run with that. Others use GSM or uh, hard lines or BT lines. Lifting systems, David gantry, jib, crane. Standard is a, a David socket supplied to, to the civils and cast into the biscuit with a David arm. But if it's large pumps, heavy pumps, then obviously a, a gantry and jib might be required. Space for op staff to carry out maintenance. That's why the compound's as big as it is to make sure there's plenty of space to, uh, for operations. And then wet well boundary, 15 meters from nearest habitable building, as Andy mentioned there, that, that, that still applies. And then the water company amendments and preferences. And like I say, there are, there are quite a few and they do chop and change, but we, uh, we talk to all the water, uh, water authorities on a regular basis. And uh, I don't think we've, we've been caught out too many times, but there's the odd occasion, but uh, we talk to them all and make sure that everything we do, it complies with what they require. And what they require, secure assets, safe access, easy over pumping, trouble free operation, ease of maintenance and remotely operated and monitored environment. We offer a rental um, telemetry system. We also have a, a department up in Nottingham who are just extremely clever people who, who can design and build um, telemetry and electronic items where two pump stations can talk to each other, inhibit systems and all that. So we can offer all that to you. And then the last thing, and this is one thing that's been, it's, it's a bit of a bug for me, 
um, benching. We we need benching in the bottom of the wet well to make sure the pumps are supplied with the, the right amount of fluid and waste at the right time and, and, and it's all going smoothly. If it's just a flat bottom well, it all gets all messy and blocked and all that sort of stuff. So benching is really, really important. Um, we talk to everyone all, all through this, but there's been a couple of occasions where the pump station has been running for two or three years. And then when they pump it down the water authority to check uh, pre the adoption, they find there's no benching because someone along the line has missed it out. And it's down to communication normally. But you can imagine what happens when someone's got to go into a wet well that's been operating for two years or uh, two and a half years. The, the amount of tankage and, and jet washing and all that sort of stuff. And then you're going to get close confined uh, um, brickies to go in there and do the benching. So benching is one thing that you'll find. We mention all through the meetings and we, are, we like to attend meetings with the designs with the developers and with the civils to make sure everyone's working on the same sheet and everyone understands where we're going to. And on that note, I'm going to pass you back over to my colleague, Andy. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> so once again, uh, the, uh, the, the SFA7 criteria um, and the SSG criteria for hydraulic design of a pumping station is generally the same. Uh, very few differences of uh, relative note. There's all fine detail that we're uh, aware of and that we're addressing. Uh, but generally, uh, the first two bullet points still hold true. I'm not going to read through them. I'll let you uh, go through them yourselves, um, but they still hold true. What I'd like to uh, spend a, a few moments discussing is uh, the third bullet point, which is the uh, the diameter of the rising main. Now, quite often, um, this is an area that causes a little bit of a, a hiccup or can cause quite significant concern later on because there's a usually a mismatch or there can be a mismatch should I say between what we specify for the uh, for the pumps uh, and what's being taken on the uh, drainage designers drawings um, and this causes problems quite often at the stage at the detailed design stage in the technical submission because the drawings don't match up and the water authority becomes um, concerned at that juncture because the, it can cause significant operational uh, problems for the station. So if I just quickly give you an indication, the, uh, the, the diameter of the rising main has to be such that the velocity uh, at discharge is in the range of 0.75 to 1.8 meters per second. Now these uh, flows are designed to give us what we call resuspension. So obviously a, a pump station pumps for a, a period of time and then it uh, lays dormant whilst the uh, white well fills in, uh, fills up with inflow from uh, the houses or the, uh, the facilities upstream. During that, uh, that dormant period where no pumping is occurring, the material in the rising main, uh, which contains uh, sediment in suspension, that uh, starts to drop out and it settles along the bottom of the pipe. So we, we need a minimum velocity uh, to, to, when the pumps come back on, uh, to whip that material back up off the bottom of the, uh, the rising main and keep everything nice and clear. Otherwise, over a period of time, you get siltation. Um, and with time, that siltation becomes uh, accretion where it, uh, it changes chemically and becomes like a, a solid material. Uh, which reduces the overall cross-sectional area of your rising main, which is not something that uh, uh, we want because it increases operational costs and can lead to blockages. So we, we seek to, to meet this, uh, this velocity. Um, that's linked to the rising mains because uh, the, the area or the, the, the bore of the rising main uh, combined with the flow from the pumps is what gives us the, the critical velocities. So quite often, if, if we've got a, a relatively early um, outline design and it's a, a small development, we'll, we'll specify uh, a pretty standard uh, 90 mil OD um, SDR 17 rising main that's got a nominal bore of about 79.1 millimeters. Uh, and for that, we'll, we'll match that to a 3.8 liter per second uh, flow, design flow from the pumps, which is the minimum. Uh, to give us 0.75 meters per second at, at set. It, that's all well and good, but if 
the drainage designer has missed that detail or they have to change the rising main for other reasons and they don't come back to us. The first time we generally find that is when it's got to the technical submission stage and we've got the mismatch. Um, and the reason the water companies get excited about it is that uh, at that juncture, they, if we go from a, um, a 90 mil SDR 17 to a, uh, a say typically a, a 125 OD SDR 11, which has happened on a few designs, um, the, the bore changes from 79.1 to 101.5, which doesn't sound like a lot, but to get the, the, uh, the resuspension velocity, you have to go to a minimum of 6.2 liters a second pumping. Uh, so you're moving from a pump that's typically two to three kilowatts motor size to five to six kilowatts motor size. And that's, that's very, very general. Um, so don't don't uh, take those two uh, two specifically, but uh, what it means is that the the pumps are now larger than they may necessarily be, need to be, and over forty years of operational life, that's that's a lot of extra maintenance, uh, power consumption, um, and th that's why the uh, the, the water companies uh, get concerned. Uh, there's a little footnote there, obviously, just to point out that, uh, as always, with the addenda, there are a few water companies that have variations to the requirements. And the, the most notable for us in this region is uh, the Southern Water uh, Company, which, due to the topography and also the, uh, the, the, the groundwater chemistry that they get infiltrating their systems, which has got a high chalk content, they prefer a velocity of 1.2 to 2.2 meters per second on their systems. Um, otherwise, design flow rates, as you noted at the bottom, for surface water are 1 in 30 um, or 1 in 100 if confirmed by the consultant. And for foul water, it's the standard half peak design flow rate, with the exception of Anglian, who have more specific calculations, which we apply for their facilities. So uh, moving on to the next slide. What we need from you. Uh, normally, um, if you talk to our ASMs at an early stage, they, they will probably send you a, a questionnaire and ask you to complete it. We quite often get a response from people saying we, we don't have all this information. Um, and all I can say is, uh, as with everything, the more you can provide at the outset, the more accurate your outline quotation and outline design is. But, uh, you know, we can do um something with the bare minimum of information we just get a little bit more involved with you at that early stage to, uh, to try and tease out the, the other detail <clears throat> so that you're designing and building um or planning should i say uh along uh, uh, the lines of something that's going to be uh, an acceptable design so quickly running through these the ground level uh for the pumping station is pretty self-evident that's a uh, that sets the uh the the, the datum point for uh, for our uh, hydraulic calculations. Uh, the inlets to the pumping station is quite an important uh, piece of information from us. Uh, if it changes, it's not too catastrophic uh, from the point of view of changing the design, but the implications of changing it are significant for the pump selections and other elements. Uh, and uh, to explain this, the invert at the uh, incoming sewer, we we need a minimum of uh, approximately one meter below that in order to fit in all the required uh, levels of control for the pumps, including the high level alarm, P2, P1, uh, the mid level and the stop levels. Uh, they've all got to fit into that low band below there. And the more we squash that area down, the less operational volume we have for the pumps, which means they pump more often. So quite important. Um, the item on the uh, on C, the highest, uh, highest point on the rising main, if you have an undulating rising main, one that goes up and down to follow the, the, uh, the ground contours or to avoid buried surfaces, um, that uh, high point, we need that information at an early stage, if at all possible, and the length to that position, because that sets the uh, the duty head uh, for the system, and all the all the friction heads beyond that are the uh, 
the only other criteria that we need to add in to get a, uh, a pump selection that's accurate for our requirements. In most circumstances, uh, you'll actually not have an undulating rising main. You'll have either a, a continually ascending or continually descending uh, rising main, in which case we just need to know the length of that rising main and the discharge chamber uh, level. Uh, and then from there, we can start to prepare the hydraulic calculations. Um, on the next slide, Steve, please. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Andy. Um, what do we do with the information supplied? Uh, as Andy uh, correctly mentioned there, hydraulic calculations that allow us to select suitable pumps to be selected. Uh, we produce the quotation, as I mentioned, uh, and then we produce technical submission documents to be issued for the adopting water authority to gain the section 104. Uh, surge analysis, uh, we do surge analysis in-house. We have our own team that uh, carry out surge analysis, and that's required if your rising main is 500 meters or greater. Um, and then the, the, the delivery of the project to, to coincide with customer program. This is where uh, I start off the, the ball as the ASM, working with the design house, the developer and the civils. And then we hand it over to our uh, contracts team who then continue that. And basically we like to hold hands all the way through. There, there's, there's five of us in this, in this relationship. There's the design house, there's the developer, and there's the civils, and then there's the water authority, and then there's Zylem. And if we can all work together like a happy family, uh, it all moves smoothly and everybody gets what they want at the right time. Communication, biggest, biggest, biggest thing. Talk to us. And then potential problems. Um, we're here to help with the technical submission and we, um, we attend meetings with the water authorities to, to find the developer's side to say, no, no, we're right in what we design. Um, and uh, we like to, to and fro with the water authorities. And, uh, and nine times out of 10, they see uh, that the design is correct. Uh, we don't have to get caught out as Andy rightly mentioned where a design house has changed a, a rising main length. And then we've obviously submitted our technical submission and it gets kicked out because then, you know, it's, it just takes more time to go back and forwards. So like I say, communication, S104, Fantastic. When that's in place, everyone's happy. Um, sometimes developers, because of uh, pressures, they, they want to start at risk. We don't like starting at risk because if you do build the wet well and you do build the valve chamber and you start casting concrete all, all over the show and the water authority thinks, no, well, we don't like that where it's positioned on the greater scheme of the uh, drainage plans, um, then the developer is at a commercial risk then but they might have to rip it up and start again. So S104 is, is, is the prime thing. Right? And then working together, as I, rightly, as I said earlier on, we want to be there with you and we want to make sure it all moves smoothly. And then just to end on that side, uh, the, the design, install, commission, maintain, manage and monitor, it's a whole thing. Right from the design, right through to the maintenance, we're there to help. It, it doesn't matter if it's a, simple little uh, uh, GRP package pump station or whether it's a complex two, three wet well with all the associated telemetry and electronics and all sorts of inhibit systems. We're there. We have vast amounts of teams in uh, the UK um, based all around the country uh, who are clever in what they do. And I as an ASM, it's my job there to make sure that I bring the right people at the right time to make sure that this pump station goes through smoothly. We only use our own flight pumps. And you know, the flight pump is, is dare I say, one of the best in the industry. And then not only can we design and install, we also have the ability to offer you monitoring and other rental applications when needed. So on that, I, uh, I'm gonna jump forward and say, that's that on there. If you need any more information on anything we've, we've shown you now, please um, send on the Q&A chat or uh, contact the office. There'll be some contact details at the end of this. But moving forward, I just want to do a little bit on, on who we are, your trusted wastewater partner. And partner, we've got a new partner in our team. That is called the Concerta. 
It's the same as the normal flight pump step in, as you look at it physically. However, we've taken a lot of the brains out of the kiosk and we put it into the pump. So it, it really has become a pumping solution. It's a little, it's a little pumping setup but all on its own. Um, it can optimize itself. It's pumping X amount of fluid and consuming X amount of power. And then it will say to itself, I'm going to wind my power back and I'm still maintaining that flow. Therefore, it's saving you electricity. It's saving you money. It's automatic blockage detection and removal. Um, scourge of our lives are nappies and wet wipes. Uh, we see it more and more. But the, the ability of the concerta is that it senses it's blocking. It, it senses the amps are increasing. So it stops itself. Then it'll rewind, it'll go backwards, it'll go into reverse, and then it'll go forward again. And it could do that 20 times to clear that blockage. Uh, it's always the correct rotation. You can't wire it in back, back to front, which we've seen in the past, obviously. And then uh, it's, it's one size to cover. It, it's one pump can cover a whole wide range of flows. And it's intelligent, it really is. It's a lovely piece of equipment, and we look forward to talking to you more about it. Obviously, you give us a shout, we'll come and talk to you about it. We put it into hardest uh, conditions, uh, a big sump at one of the airports pumping out airplane waste. You can imagine what goes through airplane toilets, uh, and, and it hasn't failed. It really, really works very well. And I'm going to hand you over now to Andy to give me a little bit of splurge on our smarter telemetry. Thank you, Steve. So um, we, uh, as part of our uh, service contract uh, offering, we uh, we offer our GSMU uh, smart telemetry system, which has, uh, as you can see there, a, a very intuitive, uh, user-friendly interface system. Um, it has the ability to contact up to 16 people, uh, notify 16 people of uh, pump station issues and any other arisings. And it's been used widely um, across the UK, as the uh, the following slides will show you, to uh, to make sure that stations are uh, monitored over a 24/7 period, um, and maintained on a on a thank you, Steve, uh, maintained on a, a a regular basis. I would say some of those uh, points that are on the map because of the uh, the, the the scale, etc., they actually uh, represent clusters of stations. So the, uh, the, the, the system has a, a management um, function and it uh, gives us a, a stores capacity so that we can stock and be ready for, uh, service, uh, for services that are up and coming on stations. It's a, a very, very clever but simple based piece of equipment and it's, it's saved a number of stations and customers money all over across the country. Uh, next slide, Steve. All right, thank you, Andy. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier on, um, we have a, a very large rental setup in the UK um, uh, and we can offer you uh, pumps, uh, kiosks, um, generator sets, um, t temporary dosing systems to get away with the septicity. Uh, a lot of the building societies and banks won't allow mortgages until the connection to the main sewer is met. And some cases that the, the actual big build is a long, long way away but the, uh, in time, I should say. So the developer will then we be wanting to run a temporary wet well. And we can do that, like I say, with temporary pumps and kiosks and dewatering, we do dewatering, over pumping, telemetry, smart monitoring, as Andy mentioned there. And this is available from, uh, we have eight regional depots right around the country. And so if no matter where your site is, I'm pretty sure we won't be too far away from it and we can pulling equipment from each of those sites and move it around the country, which we do on a regular basis. And then th these are just your typical rental installations. Um, and we see these on a regular basis. Uh, and then what Zardom can offer you, um, plan, plan preventive maintenance, pumping stations, storm and foul, sewage treatment plant, rainwater harvesters, clean water booster pumps, oil water inceptors, rental, smart monitoring, we have departments all around the country that can offer you anything to do with the transportation of water, waste 
or fresh or what or what it is and we look forward to working with you um it is strange talking to you through a laptop uh, um, normally at the end of these presentations i'd stand there now and ask for questions um so i'm going to move to the end of this and i'm sure there's questions jumping on the chatter andy could you um have a look to see what questions are are popping up Yes, Steve, I was uh, just having a look as you mentioned that, actually. Uh, there's there's a, quite a range. Uh, there are, I would say, there's a, a, at least uh, two commercially sensitive questions out there and for those customers so that uh, their, uh, their business isn't discussed in front of uh, an audience. Uh, we will get back to you separately um, after this event and uh, discuss your, uh, your requirements that you've uh, brought to, to our attention there. Um, there's a couple that I'd like to uh, to go through if that's possible, um, because they come up so often and they're a, a, <clears throat> a popular uh, running issue, if you like. The first one is uh, is one that we get very often, and it's where the rising main is indicated uh, on the drainage consultant's drawings as uh, exiting the uh, valve chamber and then turning and coming back along through the uh, the middle of the tanker hard standing. Um, it's not a showstopper. It can sometimes be accepted, but in most terms, uh, most uh, water authorities, they will challenge this. The function of the hard standing is to allow a, a tanker, usually about 4,000 litres, to, to get onto the, uh, to the site. Uh, perform over pumping duties whilst the station is uh, temporarily down and that can be for a number of reasons blocked pumps um, in one of them but more often it's associated with connections and the rising main and unfortunately if your rising main runs through the middle of the hard standing and you've got to dig down to get to it then the very moment you need to have a tanker on site uh, doing the over pumping duties the tank you can't actually get on there because you've just dug the hard sanding up. So that's a, <clears throat> a fundamental reason uh, why it's best, if at all possible, to avoid uh, running the rising main under the tanker hard standing. Um, I understand perfectly uh, in some instances you're constrained for space around the, uh, the site and that might be the only option. In those instances, I would say um, get in touch with the water company or let us know and we'll talk to the water company on your behalf at the earliest stage possible uh, to get their acceptance on that particular instance. But generally, if you can avoid that, please do. Um, and there is a, another one uh, regarding the emergency storage. I have to just uh, try and find that. Oh, before we get to the emergency storage one, uh, there's another one here, which is uh, an, another interesting one, which comes up periodically, um, where we have a, a, a an ascending um, rising main. The the valve chamber is a the, the basic valve chamber. There's no requirements for any additional equipment in there. But uh, in term in in instances where the rising main leaves the valve chamber and then starts to uh, to descend towards the discharge position so the uh, effectively if you will the uh, the the ollage between the pump and the valve chamber represent the high spot on the on the drainage network uh, which we're pumping over in those instances we need an air valve to uh, to relieve um, air and gas build up in the rising main at the valve chamber position um, we have often been asked, is it possible to lower the valve chamber to re remove the need for the air valve? Again, in certain instances, we have contacted the water company and discussed it, and we've had their agreement because they've done uh, their risk assessments and determined that lowering the valve chamber and making it a confined space is actually preferable to the um, maintenance and access issues that they'd have for routine working on the air valve. Uh, but also they, 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 they look at the, uh, the overall rising main and normally uh, by lowering the, the, the valve chamber to eliminate the, uh, the, 
the air valve and get in an ascending main that improves the hydraulics of the station overall. So they're able to take a, a risk-based uh, judgment uh, on whether or not that's uh, an opportunity that they're willing to consider. Uh, so again, as per the uh, the rising main through the, uh, the hard sandy, if it's looking like it's going to be a requirement and it's going to be problematic, we always like to try and raise this question with the water company at the early stage. You've got to remember, we endeavour to design a station in line with the requirements of SSG and SFA7 that went before it. Um, the adopting authority is effectively the design authority. Their, their acceptance of the design and their sign, signing of the S104 is the, the, the goal that we all seek to get. Once they've signed the S104 for a design, that design becomes frozen. And as long as you are able to build your station to that design, then your adoption process should go through very, very smoothly. Obviously, at site, during construction, you may have some small variations, but those are normally uh, able to be agreed on the spot. So it, it's, it's important to, uh, to engage with the water company at the earliest and get their acceptance in principle for everything that's a step away from the normal guidance. Uh, and they're always willing to talk. They're always welcoming um, of these early engagements. They sooner hear about these things um, at the start of a job than be faced with it as a, a, sort, of, a sort of um, fait accompli at the end. They don't like to be placed in a position where they're uh, they're forced to do something where they may have been able to uh, offer better alternatives and solutions in in association with ourselves okay. um i think we uh, we've got one minute left um uh, there's been quite a few questions um around the design of the um uh, the compound um just to answer them in a sort of block if i can uh, no you can't use gravel as a base, uh, it has to be concrete all throughout the the, uh, uh, the compound, just in case of spillage. Uh, yes, you do need bollards around the the hard stand where a uh, potential tanker can go into, and then the fencing. Uh, uh, no, you can't use uh, the water authorities don't like wire fencing. It it tends to be either a brick build wall or a palustrade uh, a metal fencing, and. Um, I think that is it really. I think we're, we've got about 15 seconds left. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to my colleague, Andy. Uh, um, it, like I said, this is ever so strange for us to be doing this on, on a system like this, but um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope we've uh, answered a lot of your questions and we do look forward to hearing from you. I'll leave this screen, this slide up. Um, I'm gonna say goodbye and uh, I'll get Andy to say goodbye as well. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, attending this morning. I hope it's been uh, helpful and we will uh, respond to all the questions that have been raised uh, that we haven't been able to discuss here. We'll get back to you over the uh, email as soon as possible. Thank you very much and goodbye.